NASA has a huge spacesuit problem, and it's just getting worse. This has been a really bad few weeks for NASA's already terrible spacesuit situation. Let's break down what's been going on and why it's gotten to this point. On June 13th, NASA announced that a scheduled spacewalk would be postponed due to a, quote, spacesuit discomfort issue. The astronauts had already almost fully suited up and were in the airlock. The call came through about an hour before the astronauts were set to head out. We found out later at a press conference that the problem was with Matthew Dominic's EMU, or Extravehicular Mobility Unit, which is what they call the spacesuits. He was one of two astronauts performing the EVA, along with Tracy Dyson. They weren't able to resolve the issue immediately, and they didn't want to potentially leave the spacewalk unfinished, so they canceled it altogether. We don't know the specifics of this discomfort issue, but these spacesuits aren't exactly comfortable to begin with under the best of circumstances. I'll get into more about the spacesuits themselves later. Astronauts are used to operating in these unwieldy, uncomfortable suits. They train on them extensively. So for an EVA to have been canceled over this, there must have been something big. NASA rescheduled that EVA for June 24th, but swapped out Matthew Dominic for Mike Barrett. So they fixed the discomfort issue by swapping astronauts instead of suits. So we get to June 24th, and they're suiting up again, and Tracy Dyson's spacesuit starts leaking coolant everywhere. Apparently there was water everywhere all over the airlock. Now, no one was ever in danger, but a water leak in a spacesuit is a huge deal. It could literally kill an astronaut. In 2014, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano had about one and a half liters of water in his helmet. He was struggling to see and breathe. So this is a big deal. Right now, there's a spacesuit review going on to see exactly what went wrong. But for now, the July 2nd spacewalk is still on the calendar. Remember, Boeing Starliner is still at the ISS and is having to coordinate its undocking with these scheduled spacewalks, so it is quite complicated. Plus, they have a limited supply of oxygen at the ISS for these spacewalks, and they used almost a full EVA's worth of oxygen during the June 13th attempt. So at this point, they probably only have enough oxygen for one more spacewalk attempt. And like the spacesuits, the ISS is aging and needs these EVAs for maintenance. To make matters even more complicated, on June 25th, Eric Berger at Ars Technica broke the story that Collins Aerospace, which was one of the providers under contract with NASA to design the next generation of spacesuits, has backed out of their contract. Apparently, Collins was very behind schedule, spent way too much money, and was too far behind, and they decided to just cut their losses. Understandable, but yet another blow to the already bad spacesuit situation. So, you're probably wondering, what is going on with these spacesuits? Well, the bottom line is that they are old. These are the Space Shuttle era spacesuits. The original EMU development started in 1974 and was first flown in 1981. The first EVA in these suits was 1983. When NASA realized they were going to have to modify the suit to be able to handle a lot more EVAs for the ISS, they developed the Enhanced EMU, which is just an upgrade to the original. Development for that began in 1990, and it was first used on an EVA in 1998. These are still in use. They were only originally designed to last 15 years and are well beyond their intended life. Back during Apollo, spacesuits were custom made for the wearer. That changed during the space shuttle era because there were a lot more astronauts, and to make each of them a custom spacesuit was deemed too unwieldy. Instead, NASA chose to make spacesuits in different sizes. The idea was that the astronauts could mix and match torsos, arms, and legs to create a spacesuit that fit, which largely hasn't worked well in practice. Here's a breakdown of how NASA's spacesuits work. There are two main parts of an EMU, the pressure suit and the life support system. The pressure suit is the outside part that maintains pressure in the near vacuum of space, while the life support system is the backpack the astronauts wear. When astronauts are suiting up for an EVA, they first put on a cooling garment, which is a close-fitting garment made up of spandex and about 300 feet of water tubes that provide cooling all over the body, and it removes extra heat during the spacewalk. Heat is a huge problem. 
because you might be thinking that space is cold, and that's true, but a spacewalk lasts multiple hours and this is a sealed suit. There's nowhere for that body heat to go. That's where the cooling garments come in. The hard upper torso is next, and it's basically a sleeveless torso that comes in multiple sizes. It has the display control module, which is the control panel for the suit. We'll talk about the hard upper torso more later because it's really relevant when we talk about sizing. Then there are arms and gloves, which have built-in heaters, and the lower torso, which is the lower part of the spacesuit, the pants, boots, that sort of thing. The portable life support system, or PLSS, which connects with the hard upper torso, provides electricity, a fan, removes carbon dioxide from the air the astronaut is breathing, it has a water tank for the cooling garment, and a two-way radio. And then, of course, there's the helmet. The hard upper torso in particular has gotten a lot of scrutiny in recent years when the highly publicized all-female spacewalk was canceled in 2019. Many news outlets boiled it down to they don't have enough spacesuits to fit women, which is entirely true, but it's also, as always is the case in space, much more complicated than that. Spacesuit sizing is a mess. As I mentioned, rather than customizing the spacesuit to the wearer, NASA manufactured hard upper torsos, arms, and lower torsos in different sizes to provide a mix and match experience. This did not take into account that many women's bodies are differently shaped than men's. Women can often have wider hips, narrower shoulders, that sort of thing. This makes it even harder for smaller astronauts to fit into these spacesuits, and NASA has acknowledged that one of the problems with its current EMUs is the fact that it limits astronauts who can perform EVAs. It also limits astronaut assignments, because anyone assigned to the ISS has to be EVA certified. The astronauts who are too small for the medium torso, which are disproportionately women, cannot be assigned to an ISS flight. In the case of the all-female spacewalk, at that time on the ISS, in terms of functional, ready-to-use, hard upper torsos, there was one medium, two larges, and one extra large. Most astronauts prefer the EMUs be as close-fitting as possible because that enhances maneuverability and dexterity within these bulky suits. The space block was supposed to be with astronauts Christina Koch and Anne McLean. McLean had trained on both the medium and large hard upper torsos, but reported after a spacewalk that she was more comfortable in the medium torso. Because there was only one medium, they had to replace an astronaut on the spacewalk. The first all-female spacewalk did happen later in October 2019. The thing is, NASA used to have more spacesuits to fit smaller-bodied people. They originally planned for extra small and small hard upper torsos. NASA never ended up making an excess, and they stopped making the small, which reportedly was still too big for most women, in the 1990s because of budget cuts. They never built the enhanced EMU in a small. And in 2003, the agency halted plans to explore making spacesuits specifically for smaller people, also due to budget. I pinged NASA last week to see what the current situation aboard the ISS is. Right now, they have four spacesuits available for EVAs, one medium, one large, and two extra larges. There are two additional torsos currently available on the ISS in sizes medium and large that can function as spares but would take hours of prep to get ready for an EVA because they are not currently paired with one of the four functional life support systems on the ISS. There were originally 18 life support units built. Four, as I mentioned, are on the ISS integrated into the functional hard upper torsos, while around seven are on the ground for maintenance. The rest have been destroyed or non-functional. So then, what's happening to all these spacesuits, and how are we keeping them going so far past their intended lifetimes? You have to think of these spacesuits as portable spaceships. They aren't just garments, so they require regular maintenance. A 2017 report from NASA's Office of the Inspector General points out that the maintenance cycle on these EMUs has been pushed further and further. The original EMUs were only certified for a single space shuttle flight when they were built. We've gone from that to allowing six years or 25 EVAs between maintenance cycles. Given that flights to the ISS can be sporadic, and we had a period where there was only one U.S. spacecraft capable of bringing cargo back to Earth, some suits went even longer than that without proper maintenance. 
Some maintenance can be performed by astronauts on the ISS, but a lot of it, and any improvements to the suit, has to happen on the ground. It's kind of a scheduling nightmare. In addition to the spacesuits on the ground currently undergoing maintenance, NASA has lost a lot of spacesuits. On the Space Shuttle Challenger on Columbia, cargo mission failures. This doesn't help the situation any, as they're not building new ones. It would be cost prohibitive to do so, an estimated $250 million just for the life support system, because the tech is so old at this point. NASA would rather spend its limited funds developing a new spacesuit than trying to build more of the old one. So then, the logical question now is why don't we have a new spacesuit ready? Part of the problem here is that for a long time, NASA didn't have a firm direction. To be able to come up with the parameters and agency requirements for a new spacesuit, they had to know where they were going. The cancellation of the Constellation program, which was originally supposed to succeed the space shuttle, was a big blow for developing next-gen spacesuits. Artemis picked up the pieces of Constellation, and now NASA has a direction and knows where it's going, but they had to start from scratch, basically. Now this brings us to the Collins Aerospace announcement, and I swear I am almost done talking to you about spacesuits. NASA awarded the spacesuit contract to two contractors, Axiom Space is the other one, and they're more on schedule and they aren't burning through money. I get so many questions about why NASA often picks two contractors for these big jobs. You can imagine the comments I'm getting about Boeing and SpaceX right now with the Starliner situation. And this is exactly why, redundancy. It's unclear at this point how Collins backing out might affect the timeline of spacesuit development. This is another contract like Commercial Crew. For more on how Commercial Crew works, check out my video on Boeing Starliner. But NASA is helping pay for the development of these spacesuits and then will basically rent them from the company. Axiom has a bigger incentive to do this because they have a private astronaut mission program, and they would actually probably use these spacesuits on their flights. It's also interesting to note that SpaceX is also working on next-gen spacesuits for their Polaris program, which will be the first EVAs from a private spacecraft. I talked about these spacesuits in a previous video, which I will link here, but will NASA pay to use these spacesuits if they're ready in the next few years and pass their agency requirements or can be easily modified to do so? It is very possible. Like everything in space, this is a complicated situation, but I do hope I broke it down well for you in this video. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.